All right, welcome everybody to our last and final lecture in this 10-week series, this 10-week course on Orthodox Ecclesiology. Very good to have you for this session. Uh, we have people who are maybe joining us for the first time, others who've been with us all 10 weeks. In any case, all of these are going to be online, available for your viewing at any time or going back and, and uh, reviewing. Uh, and if you're in our uh, Patreon platform, you're on our Patreon platform, you're one of our uh, patrons, uh, you'll have access to this uh, there as well and all the question and answers. So it's good to have you for this final lesson, the church before the face of Antichrist and the religion of the future or before the face of the religion of the Antichrist, as you like it. Um, what we're going to be talking about tonight, a two-part two lecture, we're going to be talking first and foremost about um, uh, finishing up our analysis of Vatican II's ecclesiology. The first part will be about baptism and the unity of the church because it sets a stage for the second part, which will be looking at the uh, last temptation of history. And I won't spoil it for you. We'll get into that at that point. But uh, we're going to be basing our, our analysis and our comments on the matter uh, on the great elder Athanasios Metellineos. So that's that's the two-part lecture tonight. We'll be in, getting into it shortly. Uh, I posted for you on Patreon just a few hours ago the full text, well, the, the translated portion of a one-hour lecture by elder Athanasios. So if you're a member or you're a patron, you can go there. You can see and read the whole translation, the last third of this uh, prophetic um, text, which we'll be just seeing a portion of tonight. And uh, you can also, of course, see all of the other uh, reading material that we've posted for this lesson. Uh, so let's let's say the prayers, and then we'll have a few more announcements before we get into the lecture tonight. Good to have you. If you have questions, if you have comments, you're on YouTube, you can post them. And we have a uh, moderator there. He'll collect all the questions for the end. We'll have a time for question and answers, final session, so we'll give some more time than usual to our uh, our, pay, our uh, viewers who have questions. And um, yeah, let's let's say our prayers and begin with uh, our our talk tonight. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind with the pure light of the divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of the gospel teachings. And bless also fear of thy blessed commandments, which have without all kind of desires. We may enter upon, upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. And unto thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father who is from everlasting. And all holy good and life, creating spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Canta pemsa safti stop nevman to ani on ke di afton ti ne kumeni sagi nevsas filantrope dosasi. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Orthodox Ecclesiology, Lesson 10, the church before the face of Antichrist or the face of the religion of Antichrist. Uh, obviously, this is going to be a very brief analysis compared to what we'll do, God willing, in about two months. Uh, in uh, midsummer, we'll be starting a lengthy, perhaps 20 to 25 week analysis of the book of Revelation. Tonight, you just get a very small taste of that lecture, that uh, lecture series. Before we get there, though, we're going to be uh, doing a shorter 10-week 
uh, session on the new martyrs of Russia and the spiritual uh, struggle, the confession of faith, the martyrdom that they saw uh, during the uh, rise of the uh, the great beast of atheist uh, communist power in Russia, especially Russia. We may look at also at Romania and other uh, places that were under the atheist uh, communist dominion. Uh, our, our, our point in looking at that, though, is not just to read the lives of the saints and be benefited, but it is because we see in the new martyrs a type of the end times. And there is so much to learn from their lives, their witness, their confession, their discernment of the spirit, their analysis and their uh, rejection of the compromise with the world that was, uh, the church was under so much pressure in the uh, 20s and 30s in Russia. Uh, and we can see that possibly we will also live through something similar. Uh, God, only God knows exactly when and when this these kind of temptations of the last days will begin. But the signs are many. We need to enter into the mind and the witness of these new martyrs. God has given us uh, their witness, their All right, we're back. We, we got a lot. We lost here for a minute there. I think we're back. Um, so we'll 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 be looking at that after Pascha, the uh, reign of uh, of the saints of the new the new martyrs in Russia, and that'll begin probably the second week after Pascha. We'll take a break of two to three weeks, maybe even four. We'll dep depending on what we can do here. Hopefully, we'll start the week after the myrrh-bearing. Women, the Feast of the Merbury Women is about three weeks. So we'll hope you, you will join us for that. Uh, become a patron also so you can get the text and the uh, PDFs and the question and answers that we'll be giving there. Uh, yes, good. All right, let's start with our lecture. So let's get into it and look at baptism and the unity of faith in the new ecclesiology of Vatican II, uh, which is a very important topic because. What we see here in the uh, Second Vatican Council's ecclesiology, we see a very important development uh, in the ecumenical uh, vision of the church, the ecumenistic vision, I should say, of the church, uh, something that I think is key going forward that will set the stage for the temptation uh, of those times, uh, which will be a a doubt in the theanthropic person of Christ. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's take it a step at a time and let's look at a bit about this question of the separation of baptism from the unity of the faith. And that we have essentially two different results of the one baptism. We have in their vision of, uh, of the church and of baptism in Vatican II, we have this idea that those who are baptized in the church differ from those who are baptized in, in the Roman Catholic communion, from those who are baptized outside of the Roman Catholic communion. In other words, the Protestants mainly they have in mind, but I suppose also would include the Orthodox to a, to a different degree. There's a little bit of, a, uh, not a lot of clarity there in terms of the text, uh, but those outside of the Roman Catholic communion have a, a different result, a different um, a fruit from their uh, supposed baptism. Uh, the, what, what they believe to be the one baptism that's shared among all the different Christians of all the different colors and shades. So let's look at their text, and then we'll look at an analysis uh, of that from an Orthodox uh, perspective. It says in Unitatis Redenigrado, the decree on ecumenism, that in spite of the differences in doctrine uh, between the separated brethren and the Catholic Church, it remains true 
that all who have been justified by faith in baptism are members of Christ's body and have a right to be called Christian and so are correctly accepted as brothers by the children of the Catholic Church. Uh, so I've short, I've, because of, of time and space, I've uh, taken two or three pair, two or three sentences and I put them into one, but that's the meaning. If you want to look at it, you can go to UR3A online. Uh, very easy to find. But the meaning here is that in spite of these differences, including doctrinal differences, uh, all have been justified by faith and baptism are members of Christ's body. And then it goes on in 22, it says, whenever the sacrament of baptism is duly administered, a person is truly incorporated into the crucified and glorified Christ and reborn to a sharing of the divine life. All right, so let's keep those two things in mind as we go forward and looking at other sections of this text. Uh, in 22b, uh, it says, of itself, baptism is only a beginning, an inauguration wholly directed toward the fullness of life in Christ. Baptism, therefore, envisions, envisages uh, a complete profession of faith, a complete incorporation in the system of salvation, such as Christ willed it to be, and finally, a complete engrafting in the Eucharistic community. Now, here we, we begin to see the differentiation. We, be, we begin to see that they're making the point they're making here is well, there's there is a baptism which does not have a complete engrafting, a complete incorporation, a complete profession of faith, profession of faith. Uh, obviously, it, within Catholicism, they wouldn't talk about this in such a way uh, because they would consider that person completely incorporated and completely conf confessing the faith. Uh, and through time, although they have a separation uh, in practically speaking of the three uh, in, uh, mysteries of incorporation, they've separated them since the Middle Ages, which is one of the reasons why they can talk about baptism uh, their experience of baptism is separate from chrismation and communion. So they can talk about it in, in different ways and see it as, as only a beginning. Whereas in Orthodoxy, all three are initiated, all three are a part of the initiation process. They happen together always. You never are baptized and then after a time, a week, a month, a year, 10 years, you're chrismated and then, and then communed. It's all together. And so we can never even practically envision the idea of one could be baptized and then later on uh, initiated more fully. So because of the separate, very important, very, very important to realize that that practical separation led to a theological and spiritual experience different from the Orthodox and the rest and the, and the Orthodox Church. And so they talked about these things as totally separate, which they cannot be, and they are not in reality. So so you see that they, they are now envisioning um, a baptism which is not connected to a complete profession of faith, a complete incorporation, and a complete engrafting in the Eucharistic communion. And then it goes on to 22C, the ecclesial communities. Now, that's a phrase they use to refer to the, basically the, the Protestants, all the different Protestant community, communities, which are separated from us, lack the fullness of unity with us flowing from baptism. Hmm. So they have... Baptism uh, gives or it flows from baptism. There is a fullness of unity, but they lack that. Uh, and we believe that they have not retained the proper reality of the Eucharistic mystery in its fullness, especially because of the absence of the sacrament of order. So as I've said, I think in, 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 briefly in the previous, the previous week's lecture, uh, they do not recognize the Eucharist among the Protestants because they do not recognize the sacrament of uh, the priesthood. And so they can say on the one hand that there is baptism, but there is not the Eucharist, which we, we uh, critiqued and analyzed last week. So having that in mind, let's go now and try to figure out what, how is it possible uh, if communion and baptism presupposes communion and faith as Cardinal Casper and others say in their analysis of Vatican II, uh, and their, their text uh, trying to explain the ecclesiology of Vatican II. So it presupposes the communion of faith. How is it that the separated brethren, the non-Roman Catholics, who do not in fact hold to the Latin faith, are truly baptized? Right? How is it they're really baptized, really incorporated, as we saw, and yet 
At the same time, baptism presupposes communion in the faith. How is it that they, according to UR 3A, are in a real communion, but an incomplete communion at the same time? You're scratching your head. I was scratching my head for a long time trying to put my head, you know, get around and understand how this all works together. Uh, so we have a real communion that exists in the gospel. That's the phrase used. And an incomplete communion, which exists due to the lack of complete confession of faith. So real communion and incomplete communion. The complete confession of faith is reserved only for those in full communion in the Eucharist. So we're still, still trying to get a sense of what they really want to say and what they believe before we begin the analysis. And then it, finally in LG15, uh, by the way, if you have the book, if you've read the chapter, you're going to see that there's much more to the analysis. I'm, ju I'm just touching the top, you know, upper echelon of the analysis. So as because of our time limitations here. So if you're interested in this analysis, you can go to the book uh, and see the whole chapter, which is uh, much more in depth. Uh, in LG 15, uh, the doctrine, the, the decree, uh, uh, the constitution on the church, uh, it says the church recognizes that in many ways she is linked with those who, being baptized, are honored with the name of Christian, though they do not profess the faith in its entirety. So we have something very interesting here. We have a baptized Christian who does not confess the faith in its entirety. That is an impossibility for the Orthodox Church, but it's possible in Catholicism. And by the way, this should be a message to those Orthodox who have adapted these ideas, because there are some Orthodox in the 20th century who have adopted the idea that you can be outside the church and yet be initiated into the church, because they believe somehow with the Vatican II ecclesiology, apparently, or with the vision that has existed in different ways, in different places through throughout the uh, 500, 600 years in the West, especially since scholasticism, you have this other idea about what baptism can be and is, and apparently some Orthodox have adopted that. Now, pay, we should pay attention here that in the Orthodox ecclesiology, it's impossible to talk about there being a baptized Christian who's not professed the Orthodox faith. That's not possible in Orthodox ecclesiology, but somehow uh, there's an attempt to uh, uh, reconcile these two different visions. Uh, so, McNamara, uh, uh, one of the uh, lay theologians who's analyzing ba uh, Vatican II, in his analysis of this LG uh, 15 uh, excerpt, seems to confirm what Casper is saying. So one last look at what they're trying to say before we analyze it. Uh, he says, where the bonds of baptism, ad adherence to the scriptures, and loving faith in God are present, we may interpret it as saying the things that divide Christians, weighty and fraught with difficulty, though they be, of course, things that divide us many times are doctrine. So doctrine divides uh, different Protestant groups from themselves, between themselves, between, between Protestant and Catholicism. So these things, these doctrinal differences, including doctrinal differences, weighty though they be, are by comparison of secondary importance. So now doctrine is of a secondary importance. That's very interesting, impossible for an Orthodox to think such, so in such a way about doctrine and the mysteries. This is, by the way, very consistent with Protestant ideas. If you go back to the 19th century, in my, I have a little book on the missionary origins of modern ecumenism, and I analyze uh, it, using entirely the text produced by the World Council of Churches and about missionary uh, ecumenism, basically, in the 20th, 19th century, and looking at what they were teaching between the different Protestant groups and why they wanted unity in the mission field, we see that's exactly what they say. They say doctrine divides. It's of secondary importance. What's important is the experience, okay? So this is not at all foreign to Protestantism. And in fact, this is a kind of Protestantization of Catholicism. And I called it in my book a second Reformation, but this time the Reformation wins. The Reformation actually uh, succeeds in uh, bringing uh, Catholicism closer to Protestantism. So, uh, unfortunately, not back to historic Christian 
thought and patristic thought. Uh, so it's of secondary importance to doctrinal matters because of the profound unity of the gospel. Okay, so we have, again, we have this idea that there's a unity in the gospel. What does that remind you of? Does it remind you of traditional uh, Christian ecclesiology or does it remind you of Protestantism? Because of the profound unity of the gospel, it may indeed be said that these basic principles implicitly include the entire Christian revelation. Even if in good faith, certain elements of it are explicitly rejected. So we have the idea that there is a unity, even when one is rejecting elements, which would include doctrinal beliefs about the church, are explicitly rejected. Uh, this, is, this is an analysis of Vatican II's ecclesiology trying to make sense of how we have a two-tiered baptism or a two-tiered result from baptism. One baptism, but two different results. We have Protestants who are partially in communion, who don't have the Eucharist, who uh, are incorporated, but not fully. And then you have the those who are part of Catholicism and they're fully incorporated. They have the Eucharist and uh, their their life in Christ is, is, is not hampered at all uh, by, uh, by any uh, separation. Uh, so they're, but they're both in the church. They're both a part of the body of Christ. So we have, we have these distinctions of faith, complete and incomplete uh, faith, uh, confession of faith, understanding of faith. And we have a double level initiation. We have these, these and for us as Orthodox, uh, and at least in my analysis, I would say that these are, rather than being signs of, a unity in the gospel, there's signs of ecclesiastical disintegration and sacramental minimalism. And it's interesting that if you read Roman Catholic and Protestant uh, uh, scholars in the 20th century who are trying to recover what they uh, they themselves say exists in the Orthodox Church but lost to the West, and that is uh, a, a unity of the mysteries and uh, a uh, return to the ancient practices of the, of the unity in practice and theologically speaking, um, they also speak of sacramental minimalism. Uh, so this is not just an orthodox critique. It's even a, a part of a, the, the attempt of liturgists in Catholicism to return to the sources. So on the one hand, you they recognize that there's a lot of sacramental minimalism and legalism. And the other hand, they build a whole ecclesiology on it. I mean, for the, to, to a large degree, this whole new ecclesiology is built on their vision of baptism among non-Latin uh, Christians. So this, this communion in the gospel, let's look at this a minute. It, it does not, from an Orthodox perspective, hearken back to the ancient church's symbol of faith, uh, where we confess faith in the one church, one holy Catholic and apostolic church, faith in the church, so therefore, it's not a thing; it's a person, right? We don't we don't have faith in elements. We don't have faith in uh, rituals. We have faith in the person of Christ. So we're saying here, but we believe in, we confess our faith in the church means that the church is a person. The church is Christ Himself, and then we say, in that context, that we confess one baptism for the remission of sins. All right. So that's it's obviously in the church that that baptism exists. And so this does not hearken back to that symbol of faith, but rather to a Protestant sola scriptura-based invisible unity. Now we have some kind of visible but also invisible unity because it's not manifest in the mysteries. Uh, it's only a partially visible in the mysteries, but they're not unified. The mysteries themselves are not uni unified in this vision, right? You can be, you can be baptized but not be chrismated and communed and all the rest. You know, not have the priesthood, but you can be baptized. Uh, so there's no unity of the mysteries. Uh, and it allows for a variety of interpretations, a, a variety of beliefs concerning the dogma and the doctrines of the church, uh, a variety of experiences, but it leaves men disunited. So this community in the gospel is not unity, ultimately. It's not about, it's not true unity. It's not unity uh, in uh, the mind of Christ, in the faith. 
Uh, it's not unity in the mysteries. It's not unity in the same experience because they don't experience the Eucharist in Protestantism. So it's a very disintegrated and disjointed and confused, uh, from an Orthodox perspective, vision of the church. Um, and they've had to they've had to revise and rethink some basic teachings in order to arrive at this point. And then it says this idea that they do not profess the faith in its entirety, those who have been baptized and have a communion in the gospel, uh, but not professing the faith in its entirety for the, for the ancient church, for the Holy Fathers, for the Orthodox, is another name for heresy. It's not, another, it's not a name for unity. It's not a name for orthodoxy. It's a name for heresy. Because if you were living in the fourth century and you were what you walked into an Aryan church parish, you would see very little difference. You might not even understand that they're Aryans initially, right? So if you were in 330 and you were in an Aryan church, the only difference would be perhaps in the in the in the in the homily if they talked about Christ and his divinity. Otherwise, there would be a total unity in terms of, of liturgics or uh, baptism or all these different things. And so the diversion and the, the, the falling away from the, just one, one aspect of our whole life in Christ, one teaching, actually was heresy, right? So not to profess the faith in its entirety is heresy. The conciliar texts and the interpretations of them by Latin scholars confirm that what the fathers call heresy, Vatican II calls Christian and of the church. Heresy like truth is not a matter of uh, quantity. There are no greater or lesser heresies in terms of uh, what it deprives them of, right? Which is the life in the church. Uh, there's no serious or trivial diversions from the church teaching, orthodox faith, worship, and ethics are all one, and they cannot be divided. Now, there are worse areas in the sense of how, how distorted the teaching becomes, of course. But all heresies end up taking, and, and schisms, taking people outside of the communion of the church. And in that sense... There's no real difference to the damage they do because that's the aim of the enemy. The, the enemy's aim through whatever machination he uses, whether it be on the left or the right, whether it be schism or heresy, whether it be uh, any anything, even non-doctrinal issues, the aim is the same. Get you out of communion of God. Get you out of church. Get you out of the divine liturgy and communing in uh, and sending into heaven during the divine liturgy. That's that's what it's all about. So when you see that happening, you know that this is not of God. You know, when this whole crisis with COVID and everything, we know this is not of God. We know that God does not bless and encourage the, the bishops and inspire them to shut the churches down, right? We know that because we know that the first thing he wants to do, the devil wants to do, is get us out of the divine liturgy, shut the churches down. This is a demonic machination, not a God-sent uh, uh, command or a fulfillment of his commandments. Uh, it, it, but how much more if we're talking about uh, the the various heresies and schisms throughout church history, we see clearly the hand of the devil uh, to take people away from uh, communion. Now, very important here, the Orthodox faith, This is this, you're going to see this come to play in our analysis of the... <clears throat> Uh, the second part of this lecture, we're talking about the uh, last temptation of history and the uh, apostasy from the theanthropic person of Christ, that the Orthodox faith is the sin quo non. It's without that, it's not possible to talk about mysteries. It is a presupposition for every divine mystery, the Orthodox faith. <clears throat> so, uh, let's read what St. Athanasius again we've talked about this I think in the third or fourth lecture but it's good to repeat and remember and put it in this context now St. Athanasius says very clearly that for the carrying out of an authentic and salvific mystery there has to be the orthodox faith he says 
Not he who simply says, oh, Lord, gives baptism. Remember the words of the Lord. Uh, you know, we, we, we call on your name. We did miracles. I don't know you, he says. So calling on the name is not sufficient. Not simply who says, oh, Lord, gives baptism. But he who with the name also has the right faith. Now, this is not a teaching, unfortunately, that was preserved even among some Orthodox in the West. We have some distortion on the basis, apparently, of Augustinian ecclesiology. We have a distortion in the West of this teaching. But this is the Orthodox teaching, uh, even if some have gotten it wrong in the West. Uh, among the Orthodox, I mean. But he who with the name has also the right faith. On this account, therefore, our Savior also did not simply command to baptize, but first says, teach, then thus baptize, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that the right faith might follow upon learning and together with faith might come the consecration of baptism. It can't get any clearer, folks. The, re the, re the rejection of Vatican II ecclesiology is right here. Apparently, they did not read St. Augustine, St. Uh, Athanasius the Great when they were de determining how to ex express their new ecclesiology. Uh, the right faith might follow upon learning, and together with faith might come the consecration of baptism, right? Together with faith, and that, of course, is not a faith in the gospel, but it's the faith, the one faith, the only faith in the Holy Trinity and the, the entire deposit. The whole revelation, we don't make those kind of distinctions and cut things up and say, well, there's a there's levels of faith, levels of communion, levels of church. That's total a, a total innovation in Vatican II. It doesn't exist in the Fathers. So they're not talking about, they're not making the distinctions here in St. Saint, Saint Athanasius that they make in Vatican II. There are many other heresies too, which use the words only but not in the right sense, as I have said, nor with sound faith. And in consequence, the water that which they minister is unprofitable, but not only unprofitable, as deficient in piety, so that he who is sprinkled by them is rather polluted by a religion than redeemed. All right, so it's, it's actually irreligion, it's pollution. How, how, how far away is this from Vatican II's idea of a common baptism? Obviously, in, in, in his day, there were many heresies, as there are in our day. And if we are to follow the Holy Fathers, we can't imagine that the heresies cease to exist in the 20th century. But that's how it would appear in Vatican II's ecclesiology, because all the Protestants now are somehow a part of the church. Well, they're not heresies if they're a part of the church. A heresy, clear, according to St. Basil the Great, is clearly not a part of the church. Schisms are not a part of the church. Uh, so. It's impossible to reconcile Vatican II ecclesiology with, with St. Athanasius the Great's teaching here, which is, of course, the teaching of the church. It's, re it's repeated again and again by the saints, St. Saint Basil, St. Gregory, St. John, Chrysostom. You'll see that in a moment. Uh, so, again, sin quo non, the, without the Orthodox faith, there is no mysteries. Let's go on. Let's look at the Seventh Day Communal Council again. We've said this before. It's good to repeat, put this in context. The preeminent importance is the is the fact. It should be the fact, not face of division. All right. So that the church saw the fact of division and not the degree of distance from dogmatic teaching as of preeminent importance is clear from the controversy surrounding baptism in the third century, but also from the following very characteristic case in ecclesiastical history. During the first session of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, the assembled fathers argued at length about how to receive the bishops of the iconoclast. Some were hardened, some were orthodox, but were afraid, never confessed, went along with everything. We see the same thing going on today, by the way. Uh, some wanted to transfer the discussion to the dogmatic plane and posed the question, is the heresy that has now been manifested more grievous or less grievous than those that preceded? All right. So the question essentially is, are we looking at this from a, as, a, as a question of degrees of, of bad teaching? And therefore, we should have a response which is stricter. For, since this is a worse heresy. OK, that was the implication. 
This is something that some people try to understand Orthodox theology on this basis wrong. What does the Holy Patriarch, the saint, Tarasio, say? And he's echoing the words of the Apostle James, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. And you'll see St. Basil says the same thing. He replies, evil is evil. Evil is evil, especially in matters of the church. As far as dogmas are concerned, it is all the same to err to a small degree or to a great degree, because in one case or the other, the law of God is broken. And I might add, the division from the life of the church is affected, right? So this is the problem. Ultimately, we're taken away from communion. That's the aim of the enemy. That's the problem that's incurred. And so what needs to be corrected is communion in the church. Uh, and that's uh, the approach of the Holy Father. And we've talked about this before, so I won't go on. Uh, you can see many times in previous lectures uh, driving that point home. Look at the Apostle Paul and his teaching about the Judaizers. What does he say? Does he say that we have a communion in the gospel? What does he say? The Apostle Paul says the same when he speaks of the eteron evangelion, the an another gospel in Galatians 1.6, which those warring against him from among the Jewish Christians were preaching, according to him. Another gospel, nothing less than another gospel, not a common gospel, not a communion in the gospel, another gospel, which alienates them from Christ. It is quite characteristic that they had not rejected the entire gospel, right? They had not rejected the entire gospel, but only certain points, such as observing the Jewish customs of the Sabbath and circumcision. Of course, they, these had dogmatic underpinnings, okay? No doubt about it. But superficially, they hadn't come out and rejected the whole gospel. But he still calls it another gospel. This could have been an, an, an opportunity for the apostle, if he was in the spirit of Vatican II, to maintain a communion in the gospel and an incomplete communion with his fellow Jews, who, in fact, held the basic faith of the church. Did he do that? No. He didn't do that. Not only did he not do that, but he taught that anyone preaching another, another gospel, anything different than the gospel that he had preached, even himself, brings about the total overturning of the gospel. If any man or any angel from heaven would do this, let him be anathema, anathema esto. All right, so that is very clear, right in the gospels, that these kind of distinctions are not made by the apostle Paul, and he considers a small perversion and diversion to be a great loss and to be a division and to be an alienation. St. John Chrysostom, of course, will follow perfectly in, in step with the Apostle Paul. And he observes that a part of the gospel's teaching does not establish a man in unity with the church, even a partial unity. These two distinctions are not made. Uh, rather, just the opposite, right? So when the, when the whole is preserved, uh, and when, the, when it's all preserved, whole and untarnished, then we have unity in the gospel. St. John Chrysostom says the apostle teaches to shun such a man for much less than subverting the entire gospel. And he says, quote, St. John Chrysostom, and he says not if they preach a contrary gospel or subvert the whole of the true one, let them be anathema. But if they even slightly vary and incidentally disturb my doctrine, that is St. John Chrysostom. Why weren't Congar and Ratzinger and all the others who put together Vatican II, why weren't they reading St. John Chrysostom? Well, apparently Aquinas knows better, and they don't need to go back to the church fathers. Uh, in this way, the apostle taught us how it is that the gospel works to unite us, to remain a gospel of unity. This is a distortion that is really an affront to the gospel. Talk about a gospel which is not totally unite. A gospel that is, uh, you can have a communion in a gospel, but not be united. I mean, it's an affront to the gospel. It's not the gospel. The gospel unites us when it's, because it's whole and preserved, uh, untarnished, right? The gospel creates unity when it is orthodox. <clears throat> it's not another gospel. It's the orthodox gospel, the one true teaching. 
when it is passed on as it has been received in its fullness and entirety, that's when there's unity. Every alteration of the gospel, even in the slightest, changes the gospel into one of the many gospels of the world, which not only don't save, but they bring ruin. Okay, so far from establishing a communion of the gospel, they actually bring ruin these other gospels. Right? And if the reality of Protestantism with 30, 40, some people say 50,000 different groups now around the world, all these divisions, they never end. If that's not proof that they bring ruin, that a partial reading of the gospel does not bring about incorporation into Christ, I don't know what else will prove it to them. That's not the fruit of the gospel. It's not the fruit of our Lord. And there's no true unity and no true incorporation into Christ where there's division, division, and division. Now, each aspect of individual part of the whole, all right, each aspect is an indivisible part of the whole. We talked about this also earlier. It's kind of a summary of sorts. You can take it as a summary of our teachings uh, over the last 10 weeks. Uh, remember how we talked about when you commune of the Holy Mysteries, when you commune of the Divine Eucharist, you commune of the whole Christ. It's not a partial. We don't give you a part of the body of Christ, the body of Christ, the only body of Christ, the total body of Christ. You might say, well, how does that work? I'm thinking rationalistically, you know, quantitatively, but that's not how things work with God. He's wholly there. He can never be divided. You can't have a part of God, okay? This is our experience. It's the teaching of the fathers. It's the experience of the Eucharist. And it, it definitely guides us in our understanding of the body of Christ itself. So our experience of the Eucharist, just as what St. Irenaeus will say, is our faith. So if we don't talk about that in those terms, the gospel, the church, unity, we don't have an experience of the Eucharist. I think you understand what I'm getting at. St. Basil the Great says, with regard to all these requirements, one rule obtains, that if one is neglected, all are equally imperiled. Right? Talking about the, the context here is just talking about the, uh, the gospel teaching, the, the commandments of our Lord. If the Lord says one jot or tittle shall not pass of the law till all are fulfilled, how much more will this be true of the gospel? Inasmuch as the Lord himself says, heaven and earth shall pass, my words shall not pass. And in reply to the question whether we ought to associate with transgressors or have any part in the unfruitful works of darkness, when such persons or works are not under our charge. So think about that. The Should we have any communion with those who do not have the full gospel? He says, an outlaw indeed is every man who does not keep the whole law or who violates even one commandment. For by omission of only one, a small part, the whole is in peril. That's the principle I want you to keep here. The context and the, the, the moral aspect don't get carried away because immediately I can hear people say, oh, well, I, I don't keep every commandment, therefore, no. Just, just we'll talk about that at another time. Where we're now we're talking about the, the, the principle of unity. Uh, that's another question of the personal struggle, and it's it's not talking about the revelation and the dog the dogma of the church, right? So here he's talking about when we put aside the gospel and the revelation and the teaching, what happens? That which is almost accomplished is not yet accomplished, right? So only a small part is put away; the whole is imperiled. You can't have, talk about fullness. I can't talk about church uh, apart from fullness. You can't talk about, there's no part that has participation in the whole, right? It's all or nothing uh, in St. Basil's teaching. You can check it out yourself in the uh, references I have below uh, in the uh, patristic uh, texts. Uh, doctrinal differences preclude unity in faith, according to St. John Chrysostom. Unity in faith is a precondition. For unity in the mystery. St. John Chrysostom says, Shall it be said, their faith is the same? They are Orthodox as well as we. Talking about schismatics. And we're talking about heretics, talking about schismatics. And he says, Well, if so, why then are they not with us? There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. 
The fact that he uses that phrase, which people like to relativize today, and you can find that in humanist they say, oh, that phrase doesn't really mean what you think it does. All right, he's putting this phrase right there in, to the, in the face of the schismatics, not the heretics, and he's saying, look, even with regard to you who have left the communion of the church, why aren't you with us? Because there's only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. They're all together. No partiality here, no incompleteness here. If their cause is right, then ours is wrong. If ours is right, then theirs is wrong. You People might call him a fundamentalist today. Sounds pretty fundamentalist to me, don't you think? St. John Chrysostom. People love to celebrate St. John. I remember when we had the feast celebration of his uh, repose, what would have been, 1,500 years? Uh, no, 1,600 years? What would it have been a couple of years ago? And, uh, you know, all the world was talking about St. John Chrysostom. And yet the same ecumenists who are trampling upon his teaching right here don't, don't, doesn't occur to them that they're not following him, that they're relativizing the church, they're, uh, they're, they're calling people who are following him fundamentalists. And right here, he, he, you know, I'm surprised they're venerating a fundamentalist, a telebond of the Orthodox Church. All right, St. John Chrysostom says, for this is unity of faith that we are all one. When we all understand the bond of faith in the same way. So doctrinal unity is a precondition. Unity of faith is a precondition of unity in the mysteries. Can't talk about any kind of unity in terms of faith in the gospel, communion in the gospel, and then have division in the mysteries. Not possible. The common cup presupposes common faith. The same holds true for all the mysteries. Why can we say that? Because the mysteries are one. The mysteries are united. The mysteries are expressions of the one mystery of God, of Christ. We don't have lower and higher mysteries. They're not, they're all Christ. Christ is given in all the mysteries. He is given and gives in every mystery, not just the Eucharist. Every mystery is in the context of the Eucharist. Every mystery flows and, and leads to the Eucharist. So this idea that we can have the Eucharist, but we don't, might not have the baptism, or we can have baptism and not have the Eucharist, that's nonsense. It doesn't flow from, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense in the Orthodox experience and ecclesiology. Unity of faith is not expressed in a vague communion of the gospel, but in the manifest unity of the mysteries. The fact that the Orthodox Church does not allow the uninitiated and heterodox to partake of the food and corruption, the Holy Eucharist, because he will eat eternal condemnation as punishment, that's from the apostolic constitutions right there, testifies that the unity of the faithful in the one faith is fashioned in the unity of the mysteries. So the idea that you can have any kind of unity outside the unity of mysteries, the unity of faith, the unity of the gospel, is just not possible. It's not orthodox. Higher Monk Gregorios, from his great text on the Divine Liturgy, which we did a class last semester, last fall, I should say. Uh, I think some of the, most of the people who followed the three classes that I offered last fall said this was the best, or one of the best, I don't know. Everybody loved it, uh, because of Higher Monk Gregorios and his patristic centering of everything. Everything was patristic. Uh, this bond, uniting the faithful, is engendered by baptism, sanctified by chrismation and nourished and made to grow by holy communion all three mysteries together this is why only those who belong to the unity of the faith can partake can take their places at the mystical supper so what happens in the context of the mystical supper in the eucharist baptism that's when baptism happens we might do baptism outside of the eucharist today but it was not the case for many many centuries thousands to 500 years, that was the practice of the church who was in the context of the divine Eucharist. Those who do not participate in the truth cannot participate in the life. Those who do not participate in the unity of the faith cannot enter in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Our faith is in accordance with the Eucharist and the Eucharist confirms our faith. This is the true understanding of what St. Irenaeus said, and not 
some modern versions and attempts to relativize that and to talk about there being uh, outside of the Eucharist, outside of the faith, outside of all the mysteries, there being a life in Christ. That's unbelievable, so, but, but, but the true that there are those who try to make St. Irenaeus say that. Oh, we don't know where the whole church is. We know we know where it is. We don't know where it's not. We know the Holy Spirit is in the in the mysteries. We don't know where it's not in the mysteries. They mean they don't mean just in in non ecclesial sense. They mean ecclesiastically, it's out there somewhere. There's mysteries happening. There's baptisms being given. That's a leading patristic scholar in the English language said that. Out of respect for him, I don't say his name. I think you all probably know who he is. Unbelievable that after decades of pouring over the fathers, he ends up undermining, overturning the fathers, claiming that we can recognize the Eucharist among heretical confessions, when it's clear that it's inseparable from the faith, the Orthodox faith, and it's impossible for to recognize. He actually taught. He actually taught the opposite. He taught the patristic teaching in the seventies, and now he says something different. So it's a tragedy. Uh, those of Christ's Church are of the truth. We just saw that, but let's hear what St. Gregory Paul Moss has to say. People talk about this, and they misinterpret what he means by the truth, because we have a rationalistic, idealistic idea of the truth. The truth is the whole person of Christ in the Theotokos. The, the truth is the whole person of Christ, the whole body and, and head, right? Church. That means the whole person of Christ is the church. Theotokos. It is within the context, this context, and with this understanding, of the one faith that unites that we ought to read the words of St. Gregory Palamas, famous words quoted by many on both sides of this whole discussion. Those who are of Christ's church are of the truth. Those who are found to be not of the truth, neither are they of Christ's church. So what does the truth mean here? What does he mean by the truth? And we have St. Greg, St. Eustine Popovich to tell us what does he mean by the truth? Because the truth is no less than the person, the whole person of Christ, the Theanthropos, all right? So the truth here is not ideological. It's not on the plane of ideas. It's the person of Christ. To be of the truth is not to hold true teachings or to confess aspects of the true faith alone. To be of the truth is to be a member of the truth, the body of Christ to be in communion in the mysteries with the truth, who is Christ himself. No amount of true ideas can be held, no amount of agreement in the gospel, communion in the gospel, can be held that would suffice to put one in this communion. It's not a quantitative question. It's not, uh, there are, remember these evangelicals who came into the orthodoxy in the 1988, they had been doing all the orthodox things, hadn't they? Why couldn't they have just stayed there? They'd done all the things all right. They had the, they're doing the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, and yet they had to be initiated. They had to come into communion with the body of Christ, with Christ. And until they did, they weren't in the church. They weren't in the communion of the church. They had to be practically initiated. Had to be, they had to become a part of this continuation of the incarnation. One must not simply believe in Christ. He must acquire him or rather be made one of his own members. And then he is of the truth and therefore of Christ's church. The criterion of truth and of the faith. No one or another aspect of the Holy Tradition, but the unity of tradition. Now, Father Alexander Schmemann has a tremendous text. I've sent it out to you who are in the patron with us. On this question, it's almost never cited. It's not a part of things that people who love him seem to talk about. I had it's kind of an obscure text from 1950, very early on, 30 some odd years before his repose, when he was still in France, I think. I'm not sure if he had come over to the United States at that point. And he's talking to the Anglicans, but he's really addressing the papal ecclesiology. So if you want to read something I think is very orthodox. I know some people take issue with Father Alexander Schmemann as an innovator in liturgics and all the rest. Uh, but in this text, he is presenting the Orthodox faith. And he says, the true sign and condition of the unity of all the local churches, that is, of the whole Catholic Church, 
one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, is the unity of tradition, which is that adequate interpretation of the Church's eschatological fullness, which alone permits us to comprehend and manifest our unity. All right, so the unity of tradition, life of the Spirit in the Church, that unity permits us to comprehend and manifest our unity. Not merely to believe in it or to possess it, but to manifest it. This is the unity in truth, in real and objective truth, not merely in a pale relative or historical expression of it. The whole church says we have the mind of Christ. The whole church says, all the members, the whole church says we have the mind of Christ. Those who don't have the mind of Christ, who have a communion in the gospel, have partial ideas, who have heretical teachings, contrary to Vatican II, they don't, they are not a part of the church, right? You can't have heretical ideas, in other words, not have the mind of Christ, and say, I'm of the church, I'm of Christ. And it's not I, but Christ lives in me. The whole church says that. And for this reason, it's tradition, it's faith, it's truth, received and witnessed by the Holy Spirit are the true expression of its unity, all right, all together. Our unity in Christ cannot be otherwise manifested by us than in this unity of faith and love. And it is thus that St. Ignatius of Antioch defines the church. So it's, he's saying, look, it's from St. Ignatius on. I've been saying the same thing. It's not St. Cyprian. It's not a Cyprianic ecclesiology. Father Alexander apparently is a Cyprianic ecclesiologist here. It is the faith of the church that it's all or nothing. It's, it's, it's all faith, love, unity, tradition, all of it. Because the eschatological unity of the church, its identity in time and space is manifested in the actual historical and visible unity of faith. Like it or not, you've got to receive it. You've got to be grafted into it. You cannot make it up. The satiric, the, and the criterion of this faith is, again, the historical tradition of the church. All right, we're, we're almost there. Last or two, and then we're going to go on to our uh, final and main topic for tonight. So I want to drive this home. Without dogmatic agreement as the criterion of ecclesiality, of ecclesiological, of the church, in other words, of recognizing another church as the same church, looking at the local church here, the local church there, as in a mirror, the one church in time and space in different places, the external unity of the church does not express her ontological unity, all right? So without dogmatic agreement, you cannot talk about unity in any way, shape, or form. That's not the unity of the church. Uh, it presupposes dogmatic unity. For this reason, the Orthodox Church could never develop, as did Vatican II, a positive reevaluation of heresy and schism. I mean, that's, that's the phrase used by Ratzinger. A positive reevaluation of heresy and schism. Can't do that. Recognition of unity can only come by way of dogmatic unity. Not a certain artificially defined dogmatic minimum, but an integration of the historical fullness of tradition. This is one of the problems, in my opinion, the major, let's say, obstacle or uphill battle for those who want to express and live a Western right. Right here is the big problem. There's been integration of the historical fullness of tradition. We have a thousand years of tradition that was lost, that was lost to the West. And how is that going to be integrated? Okay. The very fullness and genuine Catholicity of the, not that I'm against per se, that theoretically the Western right, the Orthodox Church can do whatever it likes. It can take rights and but it, it is a serious historical problem now, a historical and spiritual problem that is facing that attempt. The very fullness, that very fullness and genuine Catholicity of the church's experience of which both fathers and councils were able to express, all right? This fullness is precisely what every heresy and schism lacks. And there's only fullness in Christ. There's only fullness in Christ. This fullness cannot be simply acquired. It must be received. It is a given fullness. It is a revealed fullness. It has to be received. It cannot be acquired. It cannot be obtained. This is exactly the opposite of, this is the final final thing here on Vatican II Ecclesiology, a, a small little um, chart, as you were, try to remember the main points. 
Of course, we didn't cover all of this, unfortunately, in our in our lectures, but the book does. Um, it has to be received. It cannot be cooked. It cannot be, uh, man, uh, you know, created on its own outside of the church. It's a revealed and given, accepted and received uh, reality and fullness. All right. So, what what are the main differences? If you can, if we can attempt to just give a very a chart here on the differences: Vatican II ecclesiology, Orthodox ecclesiology. All right. So, they talk about a communal ecclesiology. We talk about a Eucharist ecclesiology. These there are differences. They're not the same. Some people want to make them the same. There are differences. I can't get into the, that all right now, but it's in the book. Uh, they have as the basis of communal ecclesiology, and this is the, one of the main differences. Baptism. We don't have that. Eucharist is alone the basis for unity. It's always through and in the Eucharist. Everything, all unity in church is Eucharistic. The Eucharistic synaxis is the basis for everything. They have this idea that the baptism itself, cut off from the Eucharist, can be a point of unity. It's impossible. It doesn't exist. It's a figment of their imagination, unfortunately, for them and for those who want to create this new ecclesiology. Uh, it's not possible uh, to talk about unity, church unity, outside of the Eucharist. Uh, they talk about outside of the Eucharistic synodicy, the church exists. For us, there is no church outside the Eucharistic synodicies. Uh, they talk about there being full and partial communion. We only have full communion. There's no partial communion in the Orthodox Church. Only full communion. Full communion meaning uh, uh, dogmatically, uh, ontologically, ecclesiastically, there's only full communion. You enter into the full communion or you fall away from that full communion. Uh, unity expressed in degrees. So we have various degrees and levels and participation in, in this unity. Unity in the Orthodox Church is expressed as identity. Christ. Locally, in terms of churches, they see Christ in one another, they identify, and therefore they're in Christ, they're identified, but in our own life as well. In, in a, a personal level, between ourselves, we're married in Christ, we're baptized in Christ, we we commune in Christ. All of the unity is, is because of the person of Christ. It's expressed in the identity of Christ. And there can't be levels. Saint, Saint Maximus the Confessor clearly said that. Everyone who's initiated, everyone who's baptized, chrismated, and communed, everyone who participates in the church shares the same identity. There's not that idea of there being degrees of, 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 uh, of uh, unity and oneness. Uh, obviously, there's on a personal level, but that's not. It's a different. That's a question of personal struggle. It's a question of uh, actualizing and energizing the grace. That's a different question. It's not an ecclesiological uh, question of the church and its identity. Uh, elements realized in separation. Elements not ecclesiastical in separation. Elements themselves. Uh, cannot become autonomous. They don't have autonomous realities, autonomous uh, mysteries, autonomous churches, right? Uh, in separation from the one church, the one Eucharist, the Eucharistic synaxis, uh, there is no, the elements do not have life. They don't exist of themselves. They have to be a part of the whole, right? The part, all the parts have life when they're a part of the whole. They, uh, they're, they're, they're inseparable from the whole. Truth is an idea had by measure. So truth is, is that something that's not a person, but in the Orthodox Church, truth is a person and is indivisible. And finally, baptism equals initiation, and there's no return in ecumenism. They talk about the ecumenism of return is no longer possible in ecumenism. Our ecumenists say the same thing. They bought into the Vatican II idea that we're not talking about return any longer. We're talking about uh, a, a recognition a, a mutual recognition in orthodoxy there's repentance and there's return and baptism itself is not initiation baptism commute chrismation and communion is initiation and those things are pres presuppose repentance and repentance is return right there is no you can't talk about repent return to the church return to oneness without repentance and yet that's exactly what we see going on. And that's one reason why, brothers and sisters, 
the question of the schism, schismatics and their return in the Ukraine is so important that we understand this is not orthodox ecclesiology, did not fulfill the presuppositions, there was not true repentance, they did not repent and come back to the church, they were, they were recognized. That's why it's a total ecumenistic move on the part of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. And it is a uh, non-orthodox and non-orthodox uh, ecclesiology. It doesn't express orthodox ecclesiology at all. All right. And by the way, that's a point that was made almost immediately uh, before it even happened uh, and was finalized by Professor Dimitri Chelagidis in one of the most important uh, critiques of the attempt of the Fonar uh, to, uh, to bring back the schismatics was that there was no repentance and therefore there was not the presuppositions for true unity in the church. Now, let's move on to part two, the last temptation of history of adulteration of faith in the theanthropic person of Christ. That's what is at stake. And we're going to be basing all of our what we're going to talk about, we're going to be basically presenting the views of Elder Athanasius Medellineos and his interpretation of Revelation 3, 10 to 11. Uh, we're going to be analyzing the book of Revelation, as I said, in about uh, three months, two and a half months. Uh, and we're going to be basing a lot of our analysis on the teachings of this great elder and uh, saint of our church, uh, Athanasius Metellineos. So it's taking, this is taking, I'm taking this from homily 162, given in 1991 on the Acts of the Apostles. And he is talking about the Council in Jerusalem, the Apostolic Council in Jerusalem, and he's presenting, as he says, a, uh, a, a, a an analysis or a look at this council from the opposite, from the uh, underneath, as it were, uh, uh, and not not from the positive Orthodox perspective, but from what a is not a council is not an Orthodox council, and he's analyzing it in his day. The preparations for what will eventually become the Council of Crete. So this is this is the Pan Orthodox Council, or the uh, what some were calling in his day the Eighth Ecumenical Council, which was very mistaken. Uh, but uh, in any case, it's what eventually ended up being the Cretan Council. They were they had been preparing it already in his day for thirty years, and then when it finally came about, it was almost fifty years of preparation. Uh, so. Uh, this is this is doubly important, all right? So we have an analysis of this attempt at this council. And of course, he's following an agreement with the saints, like St. Eustin Kobovich in his analysis, but it also gives us some insight into where this council, this false council in Crete, was going to lead or is leading, and also what is the temptation, the great temptation that we're facing and that we will face in the end times. Uh, he gives us an analysis of, of, of Revelation 3.10 in this context. So let's just hear what he has to say, and we'll, we'll give some comments as we go. He says, with regard to the Pan-Orthodox Council, or the attempt at a great and holy council that was being prepared, do you know that this is a temptation for the church throughout the world? Yes, a temptation. Do you know that what it will seek to accomplish? And do you know why it is a temptation? Because... It will strive, it should be, it will strive to dim or to diminish or to fade. The Greek word could be translated differently. The theanthropic face or person of Jesus Christ, all right? Why is this a temptation? Because it will attempt, it will strive to dim, diminish, fade away the theanthropic person or face of Jesus Christ. That which Arius failed to do. And monophysism could not accomplish. Ecumenism has established as its goal. That's Father Athanasius Metellineo's uh, stance. When the human and divine aspects of the person of Jesus Christ are faded away, what do we have? What do we have? The temptation appears to be in the last of human history. This is going to be the last temptation for the church, the great threat and challenge the church in human history, according to great elder Athanasius. A terrible temptation, he says. It has been prophesied. Christ has prophesied it. 
and it is found in the book of Revelation. Listen to what he says. And he's quoting now 310 and 311. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Shall come upon all the world. Note, upon all the world. All right, very important, this temptation. It's not a local temptation, it's a global temptation. Found, sound familiar? Looks, we're getting a little bit closer to the end times. We have global temptations now. All right, it's a temptation that come upon the whole world. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. All right, we're going to come back to this in a moment. He says, because you have guarded or observed the word of my patience, that is, with regard to that which you have been patient and have kept me, the Lord, within you in the midst of adverse conditions, so too will I guard you. So you have kept, I will also keep you. I will guard you. From what will I guard you? By the way, this could also be applied to the church. We just got done talking about the idea that if you've not kept the faith, presupposition, then God's not going to keep going to keep you, right? So you can't talk about the church without the holy faith being kept and confessed. From the hour of temptation, he will guard us. That temptation which is coming upon the entire world, a very great temptation. He says, I will come quickly, keep well, that which you have, that no one take the crown and honor. I can pretty much restates again the scriptural passages with his few minor changes, his own words. Pay attention here. What is this temptation? What is this temptation? It is written, this temptation, since it will cover the entire earth, it will be nothing else than the great adulteration of the faith, of faith in the theanthropic person, of Jesus Christ. So the great temptation is the great adulteration, nothia in Greek, right? Perversion, adulteration of the faith. This will be accomplished only by ecumenism, according to the great elder. By the way, he has many, many uh, teachings and excerpts from his ta talks, thousands of talks that he gave. He has many, many, many wonderful, amazing, insightful, deep patristic analysis of ecumenism, of the heresy, the ecclesiological heresy of ecumenism, not just the ecumenical movement as an historical reality, but the ecclesiological delusion and heresy of ecumenism. So this will be accomplished only by ecumenism, this, this nothea, this fading away of the theanthropic person of Christ, since it will unite with the other religions. It will bring about the unity of Christianity with the religions, okay? We're gonna talk about that in a moment. What form will that take? Uh, and then he repeats it in, the, in this lecture that he's giving, since it will unite with the other religions. He actually very strongly repeats it. And he says, forgive me for repeating it again and again, but he wants to drive it home to us that this is the end of ecumenism, right? This is where it's gonna end up. It's gonna unite Christianity. We don't believe in Christianity. We believe in Christ, and he is the church throughout history, right? We believe in the church. Christianity is not a, a religion. We don't believe in a religion. We don't have an ideology. But this idea among the heterodox and then the humanists who will join them, they, those who practice Christianity as a religion, they will unite with the other religions. They will become like them, right? Their likeness will unite them. They don't have to unite externally. But their spirit, their mentality, their way, the way they think about Christ and living in Christ will become so foreign to the church that they will unite themselves to the various religions. So ecumenism is preparing the ground for that. In this way, ecumenism essentially denigrates the philanthropic person of Christ to the point of entirely erasing it. Right? If you unite Christ with the other religions, or you see him as in the other religions as one, as does perennialism, we'll talk about that in a minute, well, then you basically erase him uh, in terms of the revelation of Jesus Christ that we have received, the theanthropic person of Christ. You identify him with 
the religions which are inspired by demons. You identify him with, and you see him as the, the Arians, as a man, and therefore you can unite Christ and the church with the various religions. They're all tending toward the same end. And there's a text in Vatican II uh, which uh, deals with that. That's another topic, though. Uh, if, however, ecumenism works to wipe out the theanthropic person of Christ, that which the Antichrist will do, then what is ecumenism? It is an Antichrist method, Antichrist way. This is the elder talking. I'm quoting the elder. Pay attention. When certain leaders and rulers of high standing in the church give their speeches, they often do not refer to God, the Holy Trinity, nor to Jesus Christ. Pay attention when you see that happening. To what do they refer? To God. To God. But God could also refer to the great architect of the universe, the God of the Masons. And so in order to serve and please their all wretched masters, they avoid saying the name of Christ or the name of God, the Holy Trinity. And they only say God. Read the speeches of great personages and you will see. He's talking about ecclesiastical leaders right, in the Orthodox Church. All right, so this is 1991, brothers and sisters. This man was a prophet. He was already talking about and seeing what we have seen clearly uh, again and again since those days, unfortunately. He actually talks about an, an event, uh, the elder George of Gregorio, who went to a, a early days as a professor before he was a monk at Monathos, went to America for a conference, and they came up to Elder George and they said, among the Orthodox humanists and others, please don't mention the name of Jesus Christ, because there are some people here who are attending who don't believe in Jesus Christ. They were Protestants. Uh, I think they were the Protestant Pentecostal sect who doesn't believe in the divinity of Christ or something, or some of the Protestants who are Aryan in belief. And he was asked not to mention the name of Jesus Christ. He actually, he actually quotes that experience that Elder George had and related to Elder uh, Athanasios. Um, so what's going on, Elder Athanasios? When, however, the faith is slighted, apostasy ensues, all right? about which the Apostle Paul writes, and which in its wake brings about departure from the ethos. So he's saying, look, we have this departure from faith, all right? This ecumenism brings about a falling away from the theanthropic person. And it brings about also, unavoidably, a departure from the ethos, from the moral life and who can deny, he says, that we have apostasy and consequently a challenge to morality? If that was true in 91, how much more today with transgenderism and all the rest? It's only gotten 10 times, 1,000 times worse than 1991. And then he was saying, look how bad it is. We can see a total apostasy and a falling away from the ethos. He says, if we had the faith, he's talking about Orthodox Greece in 1991. If we had the faith, we would not have had a crisis of, of ethos or morality either. And what does Christ say? He says, because you kept the word of my patience. What is this here? The word of the patience of Christ. It is the patience which Christ gives to those who have made the decision to remain close to, pay attention, he says, the unadulterated Christ. All right, think about the unadulterated Christ that he's talking about in the context of Vatican II ecclesiology, where they've embraced a Christ who has adulterations, has perversions, distortions. And they still talk about Christ, the church, the body of Christ, and incorporation into Christ. All right, so here clearly, those who embrace Vatican II ecclesiology have abandoned the unadulterated Christ. And that ecclesiology is an ecclesiology of ecumenism, and therefore it's an antichrist method, an antichrist method, uh, way of talking about, experiencing, thinking about Christ. And when you have that disintegration, that dis, that um, disdain for the unadulterated Christ, then you have Antichrist methodology and mission and, and, and mentality. So this is very important teaching 
uh, by our great elder Athanasios. Uh, the, he is telling us that it will come on the ecclesiological plane as well, as well as the Christological. So the denial of the theanthropic nature of the church, this is what's at stake here. This great temptation on the ecclesiological plane as well, right? Remember what Vladimir Lossky rightly taught in his book, which we, we, we went through earlier in this series, all that can be asserted or denied about Christ can equally be applied to the church inasmuch as it is a theandric or theanthropic organism, right? So when you talk about Christology, it applies to ecclesiology, and the same uh, goes uh, in reverse. The unadulterated Christ includes most especially and implies the unadulterated church, the body of Christ. It is as much a statement about ecclesiology as it is about Christology. This means that we should not only see as a presupposition for faithfulness, practical devotion and commitment to the one church on, our, on each level, each one, each one of us in, in our life, that goes without saying, that, in, that, in, that in participation in incarnation, that, that uh, process of purification, illumination, deification, that faithfulness to the one church, but also we need to have faithfulness to and confession of the dogma of the church our belief in the church, which is Christ himself, all right? That also is necessary if we're going to avoid a falling into an adulteration, an adulterated experience, uh, an adulterated version or idea of Christ and the body of Christ. We have to be committed to the vision of the Holy Fathers as well, the dogma of the church. This all reminds me of the prophetic words of the new martyr Daniel. When we have in mind now where things will go, he says they're gonna, ecumenism and including the new ecclesiology and ecumenism, which begins with Vatican II, but now has been accepted by many. Where is it leading us? It is leading us to a disintegration of the boundaries, a unification with the uh, various heterodox groups first, and then with the religions of the world. Because once you get rid of these presuppositions of faith, uh, of unity of tradition, everything we've talked about, the door is wide open and it's already been tread very much so by the various popes and some of our, unfortunately, some of our patriarchs. Uh, the, the door is wide open to consider the religions of the world as means and methods of salvation, as paths of the mountain, as is taught in the various, uh, the perennialist, vision of the religions of the world all right so that is where things are headed and the door has been has been flung open by vatican II ecclesiology to go there this reminds me of the prophetic words of the new martyr daniel susoyev and what he says which i've talked about in one of my podcasts uh from greece that i used to do on the uh ancient faith radio station and now you can find it at the St. Cosmas uh, um, Educational Society, uh, Homeschool Society. You can find all those there now. Uh, if you go and look up Father Daniel Sosoya, Father Peter Hears, uh, you can find also on our YouTube channel, you can find uh, those, those two talks on his missionary program. And in there, I'm pretty sure that I mentioned his stance that I'm going to tell you right now in a few words. Uh, more more developed in that in those podcasts. And what does he say about the temptation for the Christians moving ahead in our day and in, in the days ahead? He says that they're, they're going to come a time when they're going to say uh, that not to deny Christ, you must deny Christ. That's not going to what how they're going to approach it. It will be a denial of Christ, but they won't come at it in that way. They're going to come and they're going to say the various antichrist and humanist minded. Uh, Christians, in, in, in not only the atheists, but the Christians, so-called Christians as well, they will come and say to the to the Orthodox Christians, uh, you don't need to deny Christ, but what we want you to do is accept that the religions of the world, the Hindus and the Muslims and the Jews and all the rest of the religions of the world are also paths up the mountain, are also uh, expressions, and if you like, uh, uh, of Christ. 
uh, of Christ working in those religions, of Christ revealing himself in those religions. Uh, that yes, you can believe in Christ, but I want you to believe that Christ is actually revealing himself in the religions through the religions. Uh, that there's an esoteric unity and an esoteric teaching that unites all the religions. That's what they're going to say to the Orthodox Christians. And when the Orthodox Christian says, no, uh, I will not accept that, they will say, well, you are a problem for our, our society. You're a, you are a threat to the unity and the peace and stability of the world uh, by not accepting uh, you are a bigot, you are a uh, uh, judgmental, uh, and all the rest. And they will persecute those who refuse to deny Christ in this way, because it will be a denial of Christ to accept him on equal footing or him as uh, not the revelation of Jesus Christ alone in the church, right? That exclusive exclusivity of the fathers, that the body of Christ in history, that it is here and not there, the scandal of the particular, that, that you, are, you are a scandal to the world because you, in, you insist on the particular time and place of communion with God. That is what the contemporary rationalist will not accept under any circumstances, that we have to all become disciples of the crucified one to be saved, that we have to all become members of the body of Christ to be saved. That is already an anathema in ecumenism because the body of Christ now is not the Orthodox Church, is not one church. It's all of them together, right? So we've already got that achieved in the Christian version of this heretical thinking. Now they're going to extend it to the religions of the world and say all of them are passed at the mouth. This will be, Father Daniel says, when the true Christians, the sheep, will be separated from the goats, and those who are true to Christ will be persecuted and driven out uh, from uh, society. It will be a, a part of the temptation of the last days. Uh, but to see more clearly where things are headed and where uh, our great elder is pointing us, I want to take what I've posted already to some of you in Patreon, but I'm going to look at it again. I'm going to show you a video right now, and then we're going to talk about it. It is an image of the future of the unity of religions, the perennialistic future of the unity of religions, which Elder Athanasios is pointing us, and he's saying that, in fact, Pan-Orthodox Council, the false council in Crete, the false ecclesiology presented there, the recognition of churches outside the one church, churches that are incomplete, churches that are, that are uh, heterodox, it's essentially saying that there's an heretical uh, version of Christ. Uh, all of that is open in the door to eventually the unity of Christianity with the religions of the world. So what is that going to look like? Where does, it lo where does this loss of unity of faith lead us? All right. Remember, we lost the unity of faith. No longer, uh, there's no longer a unity of faith to be a part of the church. You can be disunited in faith and be baptized according to Vatican II. All right. So this short, this short clip that I'm going to show you uh, is of an interreligious ceremony held recently in Rome. With the participation of the three Orthodox, uh, three Orthodox bishops, a Patriarch of Constantinople, the Patriarch of Constantinople, a Bishop of the Moscow Patriarch Kate, and a Bishop of the Church of Romania were present. It's not the first time this has happened. It's actually happened the last twenty some odd years. Uh, so, unfortunately, it's been accepted and participation in, again and again of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, and it's a foretaste of the new order of religion with, with which anti-Christian forces are attempting to forge. All right, this is the this is the new order of things. And you're going to see symbolism here. Uh, we'll come back and we'll look at the symbolism together in a moment. So I have to stop the screen share here in order to go to the uh, other screen and show you the video. So here is the video, and let's watch it, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. I don't know if you can hear the music or not. I hope you can. Well, let's see. Um, one second. Oh, didn't want to do that. That was not good. One second. Let's see if we can do this. All right. Play it.
Let's look at this here. And let's stop here and let's talk about this a minute. Now, <clears throat> the symbolism is very telling. Each representative lights a candle. They all have the light. The light is one, and therefore all religions are one. The light is not given from the Christians to the others or from the others to the Christians. Each one brings the light to a common setting, a common place. They unite the light together. Uh, together they shine forth this light into the world. They are united. There is a unity of all religions in this light. Uh, and we see this. Let's go back to our, our PDF. One second. Uh, we see this also being uh, foreshadowed by recent encyclical of Pope Francis, which the Patriarch of Constantinople has praised. The Pope recently signed a common declaration with a leading Muslim cleric in which they claimed that it was God who was behind all of the religions of the world. This was uh, repeated and supported again since that's happened. It's been a while. So this is not something that was just a passing phase. This is, this is something that has been uh, building up and aspects and versions of this has happened before with previous popes. But he actually says and in the document that the pluralism and the diversity of religions are willed by God in his wisdom. Right? Now, some traditionalist Roman Catholics reacted to this. But, but for the most part, it has been accepted by uh, and not really re rejected by many, many Roman Catholics, unfortunately. But here it is. The diversity of religions, the plurality, plurality of religions is willed by God. So God wills the religions. If God wills the religions, that's the God, the Holy Trinity, uh, willing that they exist. Obviously, they're not opposed to his will. So they must be working with his will. And you have now already a clear step to, essentially you, you have achieved the unity of religions, but now how will it be manifest? That's the question. Uh, this is the religious stance which will support the rise of Antichrist and his rule. Uh, it has been prophesied by the God seers of the church. Is this not a denial of the Christ and his gospel? which clearly delineates the lines of the truth and the way of, way of God. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. And he says, he who hates me hates my Father also. And the list goes on and is long of such cataphatic statements as to the exclusivity of God's revelation and the way in Christ Jesus, the Theanthropos. So it is precisely this uniqueness which this ceremony doubts. This ceremony implicitly undermines the uniqueness of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the symbolism is not at all secondary. It's not a happenstance. It's expressing a thought, a vision, a mentality. And it is, it is, uh, it is this uniqueness that the Antichrist will uh, reject. All right. So this is essentially where we're headed, brothers and sisters. And this is the great uh, fruit of ecumenism and the 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 the, the backdrop and the mentality uh, in ecumenism uh, that we see being expressed in these actions and movements and other uh, agreements and documents. Uh, we could talk a lot about what the papacy under Francis have done to express the ecumenistic. Uh, uh, ecclesiology that uh, we've been talking about, uh, most famously having uh, uh, South American uh, uh, 
an idol put in the uh, garden of the Vatican and people bowing down before it. I mean, everybody should know about the Pachamama or Pacamama, however you pronounce it. There are many such incidences which express this new ecclesiology of uh, which is preparing for the way of the man of iniquity and the fading away, the diminishing, the negating of the theanthropic person of Christ. Now remember how we began this whole lecture series. With what confession of faith? With St. Peter's confession of faith. St. Peter's confession of faith, which was in the theanthropic nature of Jesus Christ. And it's very interesting that the forerunner and the preparer of, this, of, the, uh, of the mentality and the religion of Antichrist, the, uh, which unfortunately seems to be increasingly very clear that it is this pope and the, the papal uh, stance, the ecclesiological stance that they, they've taken since Vatican II. It's very interesting that they are the ones who distorted and misinterpreted the confession of, of St. Peter and Christ's praising of St. Peter that on this rock, his confession, not the person, on this rock, I will build my church. Well, this rock, this confession of faith is exactly the meeting point between faithfulness and apostasy. Those who keep it and confess it will resist the Antichrist and this new ecclesiology and ecumenism. And those who have distorted it, as the Rome did, will not. They will go along with it. They will be the precursors for that. They, it is not an accident that, in, that the, the infallible primate, uh, uh, infallible pope uh, is now preparing the way of, of Antichrist uh, and, and teaching an ecclesiology which opens the doors to the fading away of the theanthropic person of Christ. It's all connected. So the foundation of the church is that confession and that confession was, is what will separate Christians from apostates and uh, servants of Antichrist in the end times. And so that's, that's what it's all about. That's what's at stake. And that's why this, this interpretation of Elder uh, Athanasius is so important. That's why this, this temptation that's coming upon the world interpreted as a, a temptation of faith, the adulteration of the theanthropic person of Christ, it, it brings us full circle from the confession of, of St. Peter now in the end times that this will be the key uh, of the church, of where the church will be and who will be in the church, will be those who confess not just the person, but the body of Christ being theanthropic. And it necessarily cannot be considered theanthropic in the ecclesiology of Vatican II. It's no longer theanthropic because you have heresy and, 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 and delusion a part of that body uh, you have partiality, you have a partial communion, you have a partial uh, uh, a church, a church that's not full. You have people participating in a baptism, but not in the Eucharist. I mean, the whole vision of the church is an apostasy from the theanthropic person, of Jesus Christ. All right. That is the course. That's the end of uh, this lecture series. Um, I hope it's been profitable for you. I hope that uh, we'll, we'll probably post in future podcasts or just. Uh, lectures on our channel, supplementary uh, material that will go to, to boost this whole 10-week course. So look for that, especially I want to go back and look at St. Nicodemus and uh, Dorotheos and that whole question of the Pedalian. Uh, I may also want to look further into this last section and look and do more uh, 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 analysis of this uh, uh, last temptation for the church and the uh, confession of faith. So thank you for being patient. Thank you for sitting with us uh, and being with us. Let's go to questions. I think John's got some questions for us. Let's check those out. Uh, first question. One second before I get to it. Orthodox Unlimited. So all those priests and bishops in the ecumenist jurisdictions who shut their churches are in voluntary compliance with the demonic? Well, I don't know. I'd like to hear their confession and their and their response. I mean, I'm sure there is a there's an attempt at a response. I I think that the closing of churches cannot be of God. So what else is it? Is there a third thing? Is there a 
Is there a third way between God and, and, and the enemy? What What is, how do we close our churches to protect uh, people, protecting them from Christ, or protecting them from the, the grace of God? I mean, the whole, the whole stance is extremely problematic. Uh, it, it cannot be justified ecclesiologically, spiritually. Uh, you have to appeal to, uh, uh, you know, uh, love of neighbor uh, as if that's opposed to love of Christ and his commandments. The whole thing is very problematic. So I would say that if they're not helping bring people to Christ, and people are falling away from the grace of God by not participating week after, week after week. And some have never come back to the church. Some are sitting in their house because they can't stand the measures. All of this disintegration, is it of God? Is it of God? People will say, well, it's because these proud people don't submit to their bishops. Really? Really? You really think that, that, that it's that simple? huh? People, we can innovate. We can, we can close our churches. We can, we can drive people out. And have a, a clean conscience and sleep 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 well at night. Are there priests who are doing that? I don't know. God help them. I can't see it. All right. I'm not going to take the name uh, of the church and pronounce anything on anybody. The church can only decide the state of these of these uh, clerics and their decision whether it was of God. But I know that when the devil doesn't want the divine liturgy, I know he wants to shut down churches. I know that's what the devil wants. So if somebody can show me how this is an exception to that, I'd be happy to hear it, but I haven't heard it. Father, could you explain to us the significance of the icon on the slide where part two begins? All right, let's go back to that. Yes, okay, so this is showing uh, in the book of Revelation, it's from the... Uh, the monastery of Dionysio on Mount Athos. It's the famous um, not, uh, outside of the uh, the trapeze, outside of the dining hall of the monastery. On the walls, they have pictures of the uh, Book of Revelation, depicting what's what's spoken of in the Book of Revelation. This is um, I don't remember exactly the passage that it's describing, but it's the various events of uh, the earthquakes and the falling of stars from the heaven and all the rest in the book of revelation so that picture as well as the very first one we go back to the very beginning uh this here is showing the mother of god as the church the and the, the tack and the, uh, on the church the mother of god uh is a is a uh, symbol or uh, personifies the church and the, uh, the the many head dragon which is the workers of antichrist and uh, so that's also from the book of revelation a portion of the book of revelation so i there is a there is a, um, a, a, a online if you search and you look for dionysio monastery dionysio I think it's Mount Athos Pilgrim or something. He's got a whole analysis and pictures with with what each is supposed to be representing. And I, I but I don't remember right now what that is. So maybe you can find that online. Uh, Father Hughes explain more of the, on the Western Rite issue he mentioned. Could he? Could Father Hughes explain more? Are churches who practice it without grace? No, church. I cannot say that churches who practice it without grace. No, that's extreme. But as I said in the lecture, uh, that it's an uphill battle. Uh, because of what was said by Father uh, Alexander Schmemann in that in that particular passage, go back to the the portion the portion I, I took, uh, think about what he says, uh, and apply it to this attempt to recover this this tradition that's been a thousand years outside of the Orthodox Church. It's it's no longer it's no longer a unity uh, with the Church. It's no longer a, a um, expression of the life of the Church. Uh, and so, therefore, trying to trying to pick up a thousand years later where we left off in the West is extremely problematic and hard. Uh, I, I compliment the courageous effort of, of many to do that, and the bishops to encourage that, so that nothing is lost to us. But the reality is that a thousand years 
separates us. And so how does what Father Alexander Smemon talked about there, the unity of tradition, how does that um, how does it work? I mean, I, I'd love to have a discussion with somebody who's well-versed in their defense of the Western Rite and see what they can say. But I, 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 as I said earlier, I've had, my father eventually was initially in the Western Rite when he became, came, he was an Anglican priest and he became Orthodox in 1992 and he was he spent about six, seven years in the Western Rite and he left it. And, and I remember our many discussions, very heartfelt, very, very agonizing discussions about the Western Rite and, and, and the big problem was in, was that there seemed to be at least in his now there are very there are different expressions of the Western Rite so maybe other people did it better, but in his experience in that Antiochian Western Rite parish there seemed to be a massive chasm between what they were experiencing and what I was experiencing elsewhere in the so-called Eastern Rite, um, and you know, we would talk about all the differences and eventually it just became too much it became too much uh, of a reach. Uh, it, it, because many of those who had come to the Western Rite in the Anglican Church pretty much wanted to continue what they knew as Anglicans. So there was not a huge attempt, uh, maybe that was also part of the problem, to really be, to, to receive the tradition as, as it's been handed down, right? We, ha we have to receive the revelation. We can't make it up. And, and so what Anglicanism has lost so much since it's thousand years separation from orthodoxy. So I think it, I just want to say that it's a massive obstacle and a huge uphill battle. That, that would be my analysis. I do not want to say it's without grace. That would be far too, too much. There's no basis for that. Um, but it is a struggle for, without doubt. Uh, Father Bless is wearing a mask in church bearing false witness. In the sense, it denies the church as being, truly being the body of Christ and Christ as the physician of souls and bodies. Well, Father Sabas uh, of, uh, of Greece here, Northern Greece in, in Edessa, who's very well known as daily divine liturgies, daily lectures, daily uh, uh, question and answer sessions. And he definitely sees the mask as a, sinful uh, stance in the church as a sign or stance of, of unbelief or of lack of faith or of doubting uh, the grace of God in the temple. So I will tell you that Father Savas definitely says that. And I would say that uh, it can be that. I don't know if I can say that every single person who wears a mask in church uh, has that motivation or stance because I think many people suffer and do not want to wear it and are fighting it and have conscience problem with their conscience and uh, for many reasons w wish that it never had happened so I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to give the impression that I believe people who are uh, are very unwillingly <laughs> going along with it and fighting against it inter internally are blaspheming the Holy Spirit, or uh, bearing false witness, as you said. Uh, but the stance does not express an orthodox stance. I can say that. You cannot reconcile the stance that they're asking us to do, which is wear masks, keep distances, not kiss icons, and all the rest. That whole stance cannot be reconciled with what we read in the Holy Fathers as our stance should be in the Divine Liturgy. All right? It's a, it's a basic, easy reading of the Church Fathers even contemporary elders, I gave a, a, one lecture uh, in the Orthodox Survival Course, and I drew from Elder Emilianos of Simono Petra, uh, who is revered by many and spiritual father of certain bishops. Uh, it would be good if people would go back to his teachings and look at what he said and follow what he says and tell me how what he says about our stance in the church can be reconciled with the stance that they're asking us to make in the church. It cannot be. Now, somebody can say, well, economia. Look, in the church, economy is salvific. Is this salvific? It's a salvific maybe somebody would say it's salvific of the body. We don't have that kind of separation. I'm not a body. I'm, I'm a body and soul together. I'm a person. And that whole person communes, and that whole person is, is in the grace of God, and that whole person uh, is, is an object of God's love and his divine providence. So... 
you know, I can't just look at the body and say, oh, I'm going to save the body when my soul is dying because I'm not communing, I'm not kissing, I'm not in communion with my brothers and sisters and all of the things that this, this, this uh, anomaly innovation in church life has brought about. So I would say it's, uh, uh, the stance cannot be reconciled with that which we read about as the stance of Orthodox Christians in the divine liturgy. We ascend to heaven. We have, we, we have no fear in the divine liturgy. We have no fear. We have no thought. Not only no fear, we have no thought of the world. You can't do that with all these measures. It undermines the whole life of the church in the divine liturgy uh, for many. I mean, maybe there are others who don't feel that, but maybe maybe those people need to think about it. Why don't they feel that? Is, there, is it not just because you, you feel that it's all justified doesn't mean that you're in agreement with the Holy Fathers and their stance. Maybe the, maybe the problem is also spiritual. Maybe you have a distance from the proper stance and the grace of God to begin with, and therefore you don't feel the chasm. I don't know. People need to have some self-knowledge and some strict reflection on their stance as compared to that of the saints and even, as again, of our contemporary elders like Elder Milianos of Simono Petra, who, again, you cannot reconcile. What he writes about in two essays in the Church at Prayer, in that little book, Church at Prayer, I'm sure you can find it. Uh, he has two essays, one on the Divine Liturgy of St. John, St. Jacobus, another on stands in the Divine Liturgy, and it's impossible to reconcile what he's teaching us to be and do with what they're telling us to do in terms of the contemporary uh, stance uh, during this so-called pandemic. All right, next. Why isn't usury as a big of a concern among us as mask wearing when the Lord explicitly condemns usury and the accumulation of wealth? Isn't wealth itself anti-Eucharistic? Well, I think usury is a big problem. It was condemned by the church. Uh, if you're talking about what I think you're talking about, which is the uh, idea of people giving us bank loans and using our money and uh, making money off uh, of, the, of, uh, of the money, uh, through uh, uh, what do you call it? I can't remember. I'm thinking in, in Greek. Um, yeah, and I, I, obviously that's not consistent with the gospel. And uh, I've had this discussion with bishops, and I've asked why and how did the church reconcile itself to this whole system uh, and making money off of money, which is clearly not the gospel's teaching. And the answer, only answer I got from one bishop I spoke to was that uh, essentially um, it's, it's the sin of the, of the bankers, basically, and not the people who, uh, and so um, people who pay back the loan, maybe they're being unjustly treated, but we can't control the non orthodox uh, banking system and so what do you do in this kind of situation you want to buy a house I, mean, I don't think there's a really good answer we should condemn it as a church uh, we should condemn certainly orthodox christians should never do it uh and uh and so as far as the accumulation of wealth i mean saint john chrysostom has, has scathing uh lectures on the accumulation of wealth so absolutely we should we should be against the accumulation of wealth uh but i don't see that it's one or the other you know, uh, mask wearing, again, we've talked about is, is as we just said, uh, inconsistent with the stance in the Holy Temple. Uh, so is the culmination of wealth for personal gain and uh, the foolish uh, wealthy man who wants to build and uh, thinks he's going to live forever. Uh, it's all in the gospel there. All right, next question. What should I do if the only parish where I'm going is a mission of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in America under the Ecumenical Patriarchate? So I go ahead and ask to be enrolled as a catechumen there. Uh, why don't you write me personally? That's a kind of a personal question. I, I'm not going to answer that online. Give me uh, more circumstances. I can help you, and we'll talk about it. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I can't answer that in, with such little information. Uh, another question, uh, Father Peter, how can we fight off despondency in this age, especially when we suffer from things like Logis Me? Um, that's another question that I, I'm happy to answer, but it's totally off topic. Why don't we deal with that question in our next series uh, when we're talking about, or you can write me personally if you want a quick answer, uh, when we're going to be talking about how the saints uh, uh, managed to live through the persecution of the 1920s in Russia 
Uh, obviously, they would have been uh, certainly facing grave despondency, seeing their churches destroyed, people martyred, people exiled. How did they fight off despondency? Uh, you know, despondency or despair or hopelessness ultimately is a sign of faithlessness, if you really want to get down to it at the end of the day. Uh, there's a lack of experience of Christ and therefore trust in Christ. Uh, and there's uh, a degree of arrogance and pride uh, ultimately. And uh, you might not consciously be proud, and, but, but that's the root, of, the root in the, the sickness that is, affects us, right? It goes back to that root. And so one of the right ways we get over despondency uh, is we start serving other people. We start thinking of other people's needs. Uh, we think of and we live for other people. That's how this first step to get rid of despondency in your life. Uh, if we're spending too much time alone at home, uh, only thinking and worrying and serving our needs, uh, our, our interests, uh, there is a great ease to fall into despondency uh, because we're not in communion and living for our brother. But once we live for our brother, then Christ is thrilled with that stance, and he helps us and he gives us joy and peace. And at the end of the day, we, we, we have no, we fall asleep on our, on our bed uh, in, in peace and in gratefulness to God, and, and because the grace of God comes to those who love and serve their neighbor. All right, another question. My only question is, are there any prayers Father Peter would recommend to us to pray for these times? Uh, there is a prayer of St. Anatolio of Optina about uh, being preserved from the Antichrist. Look that up online. You can find that. Uh, I think there's a prayer written for COVID. Uh, I've never personally prayed it. Prayed it. What we do is uh, we pray for those who have COVID by doing uh, the paraclesis so or the supplication service to the Mother of God or to certain saints. Uh, and we try to do that very often. So we have a list of people, and uh, and we do the paraclesis in our little chapel uh, sometimes daily or at least several times a week. We try to do it for the sake of those who are suffering from any kind of sickness, especially if they're in the hospital or they're threatened to go to the hospital. So I would recommend that if you have not made that a part of your daily or weekly uh, prayer rule to make it, the supplication service of the Mother of God. There's actually, uh, if you're following the Greek Byzantine chant uh, tradition, there is a good version of that chanted online. You can find it, and you can probably find the music uh, and learn that. It's very helpful to learn by heart how to chant the supplication service. Uh, and so thanks be to God recently, I think in the last couple of years, that's been made available in English. You can actually do that. And it's a good translation, the Holy Transfiguration Monastery translation, if you're doing the Byzantine. The Russian chant is far more advanced than English in terms of a translation and setting. There's a lot more available, um, but I'm not really that familiar with it. So I would recommend, in addition to the Jesus prayer, this is your daily prayers, uh, to do the supplication service as a way of both uh, praying for others and having consolation for yourself. It's very consoling uh, when you pray to the Mother of God and have um, her intercessions. Another question from a friend. No, just a comment. Uh, I'll, I can, let's see, no, we, go, we got different questions here, let's see. How well was your book on Vatican II received, Father? This is Michelle Eve. Do you know if any of the higher ups in the Orthodox Church read it? Is it having an impact you hope for? I read it a few months ago and found it to be very helpful, thank you. Uh, well, I did send it when it came out years ago in Greece to many bishops. And I, of course, I have Metropolitan Orthodox Vlakos wrote an uh, endorsement. He actually presented the book in Greek when it was first came out. He, he came and gave a, a speech at the book um, presentation. So there are definitely bishops uh, who have a Bishop Basil essay of the Aeneo Christi wrote an uh, uh, endorsement and the pre preface. Uh, and Bishop Luke of Jordanville was very supportive. Uh, there, there have been uh, uh, notable bishops, it's very supportive of the book, uh, but they've already had that theology. I don't, I don't know how well it's done among those who are opposed to it. Has it convinced any of them? Have they, have they changed their thought on it? I, my, I doubt that they've read it. My guess is they have not read it. 
Um, so I don't really know if I can speak how effective it's been, how wide, widely read it's, it's been. Um, but uh, I, the little that I've seen from those bishops I know has been very well received. Uh, obviously, the ecumenists are not going to like it unless they're open to change. Uh, Chase, the Antiochian bishop over Iowa, Indiana, and uh, uh, mandates mass despite the states aren't mandating them. I know some people that are fed up and refusing to attend those parishes until they end the nonsense. Is this the move to make? It's heartbreaking when Protestant churches across the street don't wear masks, but Orthodox do. Well, I'd have to agree with everything you said. I don't know what else to say. Um, have have all those people written the bishop? Have they have they called the bishop? Have they uh, made made it known that they they're fed up with it? Uh, have they has there been an attempt? I don't see that happening very much in Greece. You see that all the time, by the way. There are many lay theologians, many abbots, many priests who will sit down in the middle of a crisis like this and they'll write an article, they'll write a letter, they'll write an open letter. Uh, Father Damaskinos of Grigoriou Monastery, a very well-known hire monk and missionary to Africa, translator, an, an amazing polyglot and, and missionary in different parts of Africa. He just wrote an open letter to the Archbishop of Greece and I'll tell you, he just laid it out there. It was amazing. A confession of faith, because the Archbishop of Greece has said that uh, we shouldn't just go get a vaccine; we should run to get the vaccine. And there was a uh, an open response from from this great uh, missionary. So that's what needs to happen. The faithful people need to speak up and say we're not in agreement, and here's the reasons, and uh, we're, we're you know we're doing whatever. Our conscience tells us if it's to stay away, if it's to go to another parish, I don't know. Everyone has to make that decision and according to their conscience. What I don't think is permissible is when we have uh, an, a, a question of faith, a question of church order, a question, a serious question of the church's identity, that any of us can remain indifferent. So the different ways we react uh, should be in an imitation of the saints. It should be ecclesiastically beneficial. It should bring about... Uh, a positive uh, uh, corrective. Uh, whether we have any success is another question. It's, it's, God, it's in God's hands. Uh, so I would say that um, reacting and writing and then rejecting innovations and uh, uh, I mean, especially when there's it's not called for uh, by even the state. Uh, why? I mean, I. I think it's wrong to follow the state when it's called for. That's accessory papism, and, and we don't we don't just because the state says something doesn't mean we should do it uh, in the temple. But it, when that's when that's lacking and we do it, then you really got to question what what is going on? Uh, uh, why is it continuing? I know there's always they have their reasoning, but uh, I think people should definitely speak up and and should and should make it known in different ways. If it means their conscience takes them. To another parish, or for God forbid, they have to stay away from liturgy. Um, I'm not going to say their their conscience is not, you know, they shouldn't listen to their conscience. I think that that's a part of the whole corrective. When we have massive diversion from Orthodox tradition, then the people's conscience plays a role, and it always has been. It always has played a role in faithfulness to the holy tradition. It's not Protestantism. Uh, people always want to say, if you're not a beat of your you're bishop, you're a Protestant. No, there's a third way. It's called an Orthodox way. And the Orthodox way is to be obedient to the church fathers, to, to be obedient to the to the uh, saints of our day. Uh, it, it, when our bishops or priests divert from that, and there's many examples of that in church history, and there are saints who call us to that. So those who just knee-jerk react, say, you're a Protestant. If you don't do blind obedience to your bishop, that's not Orthodox. That's not a part of the Orthodox tradition. And the two extremes, neither of them, we choose neither of them. We're not going to fall into either um, ditch on the right or the left. Uh, all right, another question. We're probably another 10 minutes, then we're going to call it, and we're going to wish you all a wonderful Holy Week and Pascha. Uh, a couple more questions. Father, are you aware of any prophecies, charismatic comments, discernment, about the situation now between Russia and Ukraine and the West. 
uh, there is there is uh, there is a prophecy. I'm not really familiar with it. Um, by I think it was a, a recent elder. Maybe it was Saint uh, Lavrentios. I don't remember. Uh, but it is it is dealing with Ukraine and the war that's going to ensue there. There's also, of course, the prophecies dealing with the war between Russia, uh, the prophesied war between Russia and Turkey. Uh, but that's a little bit different. And that's there are people who are already talking here in Greece that we're very close, including Metropolitan Neophytos of Morfu, who came out just a few days ago with a with a I think with an interview or maybe a lecture, I can't remember. And he says it's now counted by months, not years, uh, until we reach the prophesied uh, war in the Middle East, which will then turn into the Third World War. Uh, don't, shoot, don't shoot me as the messenger. I'm telling you what he's saying. And he has been right on for the last year about this, this whole pandemic. I would say he is one of the most faithful and true representatives in the Episcopacy in the church today. So I certainly trust him. I've grown to know him and speak to him on a number of occasions. And I think he's a trustworthy uh, descent, disciple of the saints. I mean, he speaks from the saints. Everything he says, the saints said this. St. Porphyrius told me this. St. Paisius told me this. Uh, so the fact that he's saying now we're months, not years away from a war in the Middle East, this massive war that's been prophesied by other people, including St. Paisios, well, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, God help us. Uh, other than that, I don't know what else to say. Look up the uh, prophecy. Maybe somebody can help him uh, or her uh, in, uh, in the comments section here. Uh, we have from Alexander the following quote from Father Lazar of Ostrog. In the last days, it will be extremely hard to advance in any virtue. Those who, who will still be able to confess that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will be saved. The most important to remember is God will never leave us. Only thing that can happen is that we might leave him. So we should pray constantly to, to God this way. Please, Lord, do not let me leave you. Very good. Thank you, Alexandra. A man of God indeed. God help us. Another question. Uh, or another comment, actually. Father, I visited a parish recently where the priest made an announcement that a 20-year-old parishioner, uh, he was actually an inquirer, not yet an Orthodox, took the vaccine and collapsed and died the next day. I'm so sorry. God help her. her. That's very sad. No prior medical conditions. Why don't people pay attention to these things? I, I really, one of my pet peeves when I tell my friends who are doctors, I say, you know, they're up to like 3,500 deaths. I just read this today. I think it's true. I mean, I, I haven't, haven't confirmed it. So if, if anybody wants to confirm it and let me know, I didn't have time to confirm it. But it, somebody, uh, there were some stats that were, pet, that were given that 3,500 deaths in the United States from the various vaccine um the reporting has given that. And yet, in the same report, it says all those were not confirmed to have anything to do with the vaccine. How is that possible? How is it possible for you to have people die within days of the vaccine, 3,500 of them, and yet in the same report say, we've, we've, we've uh, done research, we've examined all these, and none of them died from the vaccine? Are you kidding me? Like, who's going to believe that? Like, who, what gullible person would actually believe that? And then what really bothers me is when I tell my friends who are doctors, a couple of them who are kind of in between, they're not really, they, they're kind of for, but, you know, anyway, they're, they're thoughtful people, but sometimes they're really irritating because they say, well, that percentage of total vaccine, uh, vaccines have been given, well, it's a very small percentage, like 0 0.5 or something. And I'm sitting to myself, but they don't need the vaccine. We have medicine. So if it was a life-threatening disease that would kill people of all ages, and there would be not 0.3% or what is it, 0, 0 something percent or 1% or whatever it is of the population that dies from this, 0 0.03 or something, what is it? Then you might say, well, it's worth the risk, but 
most people who die from this, first of all, are above 50, 60, 70 years old. So all these people who are dying, a 28-year-old here who dies, and then you say, well, it's just, just chalk it up to percentages. It's a low percentage when other vaccines kill. Somebody wrote me and said that this, this in the four or five month period since they started giving these vaccines, 3,500 people died. That's more people than all of the other vaccines. 30 years, they've been counting for 30 years with this, this method in the United States. If you put all the people who died after receiving the, vac the various vaccines for the last 30 years, this is as much or more. It's about the same number. And that doesn't bother us. That doesn't. That doesn't occur to us to be very problematic. I don't know what else to say. Uh, we're becoming we're becoming callous if we think that these people's lives were, you know, an accident or well, what can we do? It's it's worth the risk. No, it's not. It's not worth the risk. All right, another question. So, what can people do who have spiritual leaders who are imposing on people all this antichrist current from experience? Those who remain in this environment of foreign ecclesiology will be influenced knowingly or unknowingly. In other words, here in Australia, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese closes the door to heretics from entering the Orthodox Church by accepting the heretical baptism. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. When you recognize, you don't baptize, you ignore the patristic criteria, the presuppositions for economy, you don't, you don't, you ignore the fact that they, they've, they've rejected and, 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 and jettisoned even the form. There's no basis for economy, and you, and you receive them, and you even talk about accepting their baptism, you even talk about them being a part of the church. You are essentially burying them alive spiritually. And then he goes on the question, if even if they want to be baptized, they refuse to do so since they recognize their baptism. That is, that is the most egregious sin of priests today. And I'll tell them to their face. Anybody who wants to come and talk to me, write me, challenge me, I'd love to talk to you if you're a priest out there. If people come to you and beg you to be baptized and you refuse to baptize them, it's a sin. It's a, it's a gross, sinful stance that you have. There's no church father who would do that. There's no reason to do that. There's no basis for it in church teaching. Why are you doing this? Why are you creating problems with their conscience? Why are you forcing them to go and find and, and, and disobey you and the bishop and all the rest? There's no need. Economy is for an urgent need for an exception to the rule. When you're forced into it because otherwise they won't come into the church. When they're begging you to be baptized and you've refused to baptize them, you're essentially forcing them to, to, to leave you or to go another route. No, your understanding of, of economy is wrong if you think that you have to impose it on the people. Or you hear priests say, well, I was chrismated, therefore you must be chrismated. That doesn't follow at all. Economy is an exception. It's an exceptional exception, and it's a departure for a time, and there are presuppositions. Nobody has to be chrismated, even if you were chrismated. And you're, even if, you're con if, if your context was justified, which I don't know of any, I mean, maybe one in a, in a million or one in a 10,000 are justified today. Really, the, the, the heterodox are so far from orthodox teaching on this that there's no reason not to baptize across the board. But in any case, even if there was a reason for a priest to have to receive a chrismation, he doesn't impose that on everybody. Why? Father Sarah from Rose didn't do that. He was chrismated. He baptized everybody because the Church abroad said baptize everybody. So ultimately, we have a serious problem with our understanding of the mysteries of the ecclesiology, and now we're and now we're talking about having to force people to be chrismated even when they don't want to be baptized. That's obviously not the patristic mind. And I, I just I don't know. I just it's just tragic. It's tragic, and it's it's very sad and irritating uh, because they end up uh, you know distraught. A lot of people are distraught and say, oh, well, I want to be baptized. They didn't baptize me. Why?" And then the rest of the, they they go on with this for for years, and then and then th their problem is that they're just not humble. They just need they need to be humble and accept the priest. But it was an error. You're not following the Holy Fathers. So why why should they accept it? If Christians are supposed to love their enemies, then how is it that the Christian kings became saints after commanding armies and engaging in war? All right, so we're going to leave this question because that's an involved question. We're two twenty. 
We'll pick it up, uh, Kiko, uh, at the uh, Thursday uh, question and answer session. Fernando and Peter, Anayotis, uh, Xenia, Fernando, all these, uh, all, all the rest of the questions and any other questions you have, bring them to your, bring them to the question and answer session on Thursday, our last one before we take a break. Look forward to seeing you then. Thank you for joining me. I hope this has been very beneficial. Remember, uh, from this session, remember the cornerstone, the foundation, confession of the theanthropic nature of Jesus Christ in his person and his body, the church. This is the key going forward. This confession of faith is what will be challenged in various ways in the ecumenistic uh, uh, arena and mentality. And this is what we have to stand against if we're going to be in the grace of God and have the power uh, by God to be to resist temptations. You know, those who depart from the teaching lose the grace of God. Don't forget that. It's not just your personal struggle. It's also the confession of faith. And to remain faithful to the revelation and the patristic mind and teachings to be in the grace of God. You cannot teach error. You cannot reject people when they come and want to be baptized and then have to expect to make progress in the spiritual life. You cannot teach heretical ecclesiologies and have the grace of God. God hates the distortion of his person and his body. He hates these newfangled, innovative ideas about his church. Uh, he hates the sinful stance uh, that uh, the world wants us all to take recognizing the religions as revelations of the one God and uh, forcing people into the various contortions of standing in the holy temple uh, in a worldly manner with worldly ideas and worldly thoughts and not ascending into heaven. All these various temptations. You notice how they're all attacking the church. They're attacking the body of Christ. This is the temptation. This is all, It's all the same spirit of, of, of the enemy, undermining our unity, undermining the mind of Christ in us, undermining the, the grace of God in us. So it, it's all connected. You can say, some people might say, well, why did you talk so long? Ten weeks about ecclesiology. Brothers and sisters, this is what's at stake today. This is the issue of our day. And it's being attacked in a variety of ways, including through COVID and all the nonsense and all the measures. Um, so we've got we've to have that foundation. Now, going forward, we're going to look at now how some of the saints during the, during the Soviet period uh, resisted the spirit of Antichrist, uh, the atheist mentality. And so we're going to look now in practice the spiritual life and how they, 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 they maintained the stance of the Orthodox in all these various ways and temptations with surgeonism and ecumenism and all the various isms that were being or undermining the, the, the renovationist, uh, so-called renovationist church, uh, all of that is going to be very instructive for us. So I hope you join us three, four weeks from now. We'll see when we start. I'll make an announcement probably during Bright Week. Uh, you know, keep an eye out. Uh, and we'll have the guides of the new martyrs. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be a wonderful course. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, thank you for being with us. God bless you. A, a blessed Holy Week. May you all enter deeply. If you can't, always get to church or if you're shut out of church for some reason or if you're far from a church get a hold of the services online download them read them don't allow the holy week to pass by outside of the divine service even if it's in your own room do whatever you have to do do whatever you have to do to to, to celebrate the feast and enter into the to the to the uh, the whole passion and resurrection of our lord jesus christ don't let this opportunity pass by. Don't let other people's mind, mindlessness and sinfulness obstruct you from entering in. Do what it takes. If it means you got to get in a car, go spend the week in the Pasca at a monastery, go to a parish two hours away, three hours away, five hours away. I've got somebody, a friend of mine, going five hours every Sunday. Whatever it is, that uh, follow the conscience, follow the teachings of the church, and do as necessary. And, and God sees all of that. Remember the story, and I'll close with this. Remember the story from the Yerontikon sayings of the, the fathers. There was a, a an ascetic who was who was living far away from the source of water in the desert, and he had to walk very far to get his water every day. And so he said one day, why am I living so far away from the water? Why don't I go and live and be right next to it? And therefore, I don't have to walk every day and struggle so hard to get to the water every day and 
I'll spend more time, let's say, in my cell reading. So he decided to do that. And the day that he did, he goes to put his shoes on and he sees a few feet away from him another monk, another person putting his shoes on. And uh, no, I got it wrong. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm confusing two different stories. Um, he he sees one day, as, as the last days he's thinking this, he sees an angel of God counting his steps from his khalid to the water. And he he says, why are you counting? He says, what are you doing? He says, I'm counting every step you take because all of it is a part of your struggle. All of it is... is uh, uh, is counted by God uh, as a part of of the ascetic life you lead, and therefore uh, it's uh, it's rewarded by God. So, you know, he went hours to get his water. We go hours to get our divine liturgy and our holy communion. All of it is counted by God. Don't have any doubt that God doesn't see all of it. He counts all of it, and it's all a part of the struggle. So, don't lose heart. Don't lose courage. Keep praying. Keep struggling. God sees all of it. He's allowed all this for our salvation. Uh, there's a lot that we can be gained that can be gained through it, in spite of it, in spite of the distortions. We can we can gain by our faithfulness to Christ. So, uh, God bless you. We'll say the prayers. We'll see you on the other side of Pascha. Uh, may you have a bright and wonderful and blessed Pascha. Uh, and God bless you all. So son kiri et on ma on so kev long ye son think clear on a me on so ni kas dis basi mem sing kantam var var on dor u menos ket on son filanton the Atusta Brusu Politema. Through the prayers of all the fathers of Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy us and save us. Amen. God bless. God be with you all. Amen. <laughs>